Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome everyone back <clears throat> to our discussion on Mahamudra meditation. So yesterday we discussed the first method or the technique of working with thoughts through abruptly cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts. Our first method. And uh, that method will help us to recognize uh, arising. It helps us to recognize the arising of present uh, emotions as well. It helps us to recognize present experience of any perceptions. And so all together this technique <clears throat> is actually helping us to recognize uh, what we call the present mind. Uh, Mind of the Tambo, Tadar Jisheba, First, we need to recognize <coughs> or identify the mind of the present moment. And then, we need to look at the nature of that present moment in mind. So, if we don't do that, then it's going to be difficult for us to look at the nature of our present moment in mind without first having recognized it or identified it in some way. <clears throat> so when we say in Mahamudra teachings, look at the nature of thoughts. If we can't recognize the arising or present thought, how can we look at its essence? In our usual everyday life experience, we only recognize thoughts after they have ceased. So how do you look at the nature of a ceased thought in a present moment. <clears throat> it becomes uh, quite challenging. So therefore, in order to penetrate nature of a mind to its fundamental core essence, we must first have this uh, ability to see the present mind first. Then we can penetrate its essence. So therefore this first technique is uh, actually a very uh, uh, important technique. Even though it is a little irritating technique, irritating meditation, you know, it's not as, uh, you know, cozy as you want. <laughs> right? In Mahamudra, you just want to relax. You know, you want the easy time. Uh, sorry to say that. It doesn't start, you know, with that. You know, this technique is not so cozy, you know, not so kind of easy going. It is a very, very 
uh, concentrated. It's very one-pointed meditation. One-pointedly cutting, abruptly, suddenly arisen thoughts. You know, so this is quite... Uh, uh, at the beginning you may feel it's kind of unpleasant to do it. As we discussed yesterday, you know, when we start doing this, there will be lots of thoughts arising, lots of things to cut. But if you keep doing it, this will help us to recognize the present mind. You know, that makes a good ground for us, perfect ground for Mahamudra. You know, otherwise, without such groundwork here, our Mahamudra or Dzogchen meditation will become just a good theory. Again, once again. <laughs> you know, uh, theory is not only in the philosophical situations of Madhyamaka analysis, but also here in Mahamudra and Dzogchen. You know, this becomes a really nice theory again. Relaxing at ease, looking at the present mind, you know, it's, it's a theory, it's a nice theory. But when you start doing it, it's, it's really nothing is happening. Or sometimes we think we are doing it, but at the end we realize we are not doing it. And so, therefore, we must have this ground, foundation. Uh, Mm -hmm. So we need to create a good ground from which we can build our practice of abruptly cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts. <clears throat> and then the second, then it comes So once you have done the first technique for a while, <clears throat> uh, for a solid period of time, and then you must try it as a second method, which is simply uh, resting without contrivance. Yes, resting without the contrivance, <clears throat> without altering anything. So at this point <clears throat> it says that uh, our physical posture should relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we can relax the body and the mind so that we can bring more relaxation to our physical posture and also more of a sense of relaxation through <clears throat> our gaze. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to concentrate a lot of energy in our eyes. But just have a relaxed gaze. Mm -hmm. And then we can and then when thoughts arise within this state, then we simply let them do that. Whatever thoughts are arising, we let them arise. We let it arise, <clears throat> we let it cease, we let it manifest, we let the thoughts manifest, we let the thoughts unfold. At that point, <clears throat> at this point, do not try to stop thought. Do not try to cut thought. Do not try to also sustain thought. Live it on its own. 
남도 코란을 안 하자고 코란 가르치는 거예요. Just leave the thought on its own. Let it do whatever it wants to do. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, at the same time, make sure that we are not <clears throat> overpowered by thoughts or following thoughts, uh, thoughts command. So we make sure that we're not overpowered by our thoughts. <clears throat> yes. Good translation. Namdo ke wang to masong sebe kaso maing sawale. Shema kaya malo. And what this means is that we are not distracted. <coughs> Nothing other than that. When we say, don't let thoughts um, <coughs> command you. <coughs> or don't go under the influence of thoughts. Simply means being aware, being non distracted. Namdo Sangi Mangyung. Kang Chuna and the Kago Mendo. Whatever thoughts arise, whether they're good thoughts or bad thoughts, we don't need to block them. And uh, at the same time, do not change our meditation. Do not need to change our meditation. Do not try to make our resting longer. Do not kind of stretch our calmness longer. Or do not try to improve our calmness freedom from thoughts. You know, try not to change, contrive, uh, alter our meditation here, but simply relax. You know, within these thoughts arising, like yesterday's song, um, when you look at the clear, bright ocean, and so on. <clears throat> like that song. See thoughts as a display, manifestation of nature of mind. Simply relax. This becomes possible when we have done the first technique. Then resting within thought becomes possible because now we can recognize thoughts, present thoughts. Now we can see present thoughts when they are present, not when they are in the past. That's why this is possible now. Now we can do this, let thought arise and go, cease, because we have cut through suddenly arisen thoughts in the past, so we know arising and the cessation of these thoughts. Tolje be jole ya bo ma kum na tene kan jar so me cha de ha jan ka le ka bo. If we don't first cultivate the experience of cutting through thoughts with the first technique, then it will be very difficult for us to practice the second technique of resting on contrived with whatever occurs. This one's on Tambo, Kangja Swami, the Tambo, the Tsik Nyambo Yore. Tichego Sayamambo Shari Vede. In a good 
Toggi Beggio, ma c'è per Kangsha Swami, c'è una cosa che Kangsha Swami è capito. So even though resting uncontrived with whatever occurs or with whatever arises is a, a nice sounding phrase, it's still going to be very difficult for us to experience if we don't cut through our thoughts first with the, with the first stage. <coughs> So, in order for this state of resting uncontrived to take place, we really have to go through this first stage first of cutting through the suddenly arisen thoughts. <coughs> And then when we reach the second stage, we look at the essence of the thoughts and wrestle with him. Mm-hmm. And we rest within that um, in a manner that was described by Milarepa when which we also discussed today. <coughs> and in particular, um, from among these three stages, we concentrate on the first two, looking nakedly and resting directly. When thoughts arise, in the present, look at the present thought nakedly. As we discussed earlier, looking here means experiencing. Experiencing them nakedly with uh, uh, mind be. So. Mm-hmm. With non distracted attention. With non distracted attention, just experience the arising of present thought. <clears throat> if we can be totally non-distracted and with that attention, if we can fully experience the currently arising thought, then we can penetrate its essence. Whether we can penetrate or not depends on how uh, on how much we are distracted or not. Yeah, it depends on how much we are distracted or not. <laughs> you know, more we are not distracted and more we can experience it nakedly, that much you are penetrating its essence. You know, penetrating here sometimes is a little uh, uh, easy to misunderstand. Penetrating here doesn't mean like you have to do something in a dualistic sense to penetrate. You know, penetrating here is experiencing as nakedly as possible with as much non-distraction as possible. Then we are penetrating its essence. And if we can do that, then we become, then we get closer and closer to the nature of mind. We get closer and closer to the Dharmakaya. Sanji ji she, Ranga Samji Nero, Sanji ji she, la Nero Nero And we get closer and closer to the nature of our own mind, which is the wisdom of enlightenment. And therefore, we become closer and closer to the state of Buddhahood itself. So that's easy, right? The state of Buddhahood is getting easier and easier. <laughs> Um, so there, 
example, while we are doing this, when we are experiencing thought nakedly, resting directly, and then another thought moves, right? Again, another thought will move, and then you do the same thing. When this another thought is moving, experience it nakedly, rest directly within that thought, its movement. There's always movement taking place. De la cara se indos, no? De de chonga ina rangingi, de ne namdo chowa na, namdo gyobate, chonga chonga do gris. And if we practice this way, the natural result of that will be that um, the wildness of our mind, our wild discursive thoughts, will decrease. Namdo chowa gyobate do nam nam shuki chugi inzo chonga do gris. So, <coughs> completely naturally, these um, thoughts of discursiveness and wildness will be liberated in the expanse of the Dharma Kaya. Just like waves are naturally liberated back into the expanse of the ocean. So no matter how big a wave is, you don't need to bring in some other force in order to cause it to go back into the ocean. Its very nature is to dissolve back into the ocean. So in the same way, no matter how strong and coarse a thought might be in our mind, and no matter how wild or discursive our minds might be, the nature of those thoughts is to dissolve back into the Dharmakaya. And when we have the experience of this, this is the second stage of resting. Um, yesterday we talked about the first stage of resting, which is like a steep waterfall. And this experience that we're talking about today is like the flow, the steady flow of a river. So, when the water falls over the, the cliff and it's falling down that waterfall, it falls very um, violently and actively, wildly, so to speak. But then when, it, when the water reaches the pool at the bottom, it's, it then flows very slowly and gently outwards. So when we reach this experience, we are having a firm experience of resting or abiding, <coughs> dwelling in the essence of mind. <clears throat> in the Psalms of Realization of the Kagyu Gurus, it says, when you don't alter your mind, it is blissful. When you don't stir up water, it is clear. When you don't alter your mind, it is blissful. When you don't stir up water, it is clear. Hajang. 
When we don't alter our thinking mind, when we don't alter the thoughts that arise in our mind, that's a very pleasant experience because the thoughts are the nature of the Dharmakaya. They are of the nature of Dharmakaya. And when we don't try to change that, then that's very pleasant. It doesn't cause any suffering. The thoughts are <coughs> incapable of producing suffering in our minds when we don't try to change them or alter them. But And this is just like when we don't stir up water, the water naturally clarifies itself. <coughs> And so now we'll practice this second technique of resting uncontrived with whatever occurs together for a brief period. And this will be just to make an auspicious connection with the practice. If we want to actually practice this in a proper way, then of course we need to proceed it with the first stage and, and practice that one for quite some time. And begin by using the common practice of shamatha, focusing on the breath. And then using the breath as a support. We allow our minds to relax into their own natural state. And when we are resting, relaxed, and undistracted in this way, if a thought arises, we look nakedly at the essence of that thought. As soon as the thought arises, we nakedly experience its essence.
남동아 노벌에서 구우면 야벌에서 두구우면 노벌에서 가구우면 그런 법수죠. We don't need to label, label our thoughts as bad and try to block them or label them as good and try to keep them. We just relax and let our minds rest in their natural state. Thank you. Malaria the song. Chaja Chambo, Gontuso, Tungo Tungo Yang Yangos. Milarepa said when meditating on Mahamudra, meditate in short and frequent sessions. When we practice in short sessions, repeatedly, again and again, then this becomes a very effective way to practice. <clears throat> and so, in short, the second <clears throat> method here <clears throat> is teaching us to let thought be whatever they are. Don't try to change their characteristics. Don't try to impose any <coughs> labels. Don't try to make them into something. Just let the thought be whatever. <clears throat> Usually, in our pattern, we are always, always grabbing our thoughts when they are passing by. You know, thoughts are passing by and we try to grab them and keep them there and try to <clears throat> change them in different forms. Right? It's a kind of very abusive. <clears throat> it's not a very nice thing to do. <clears throat> but we are doing that all the time to our thoughts. And uh, not only that, but we complain about thoughts bothering us <laughs> all the time. <clears throat> but actually, when you really look at it, you know, we are bothering our thoughts <laughs> uh, more than what thoughts are bothering us. Uh, we're not letting them be who they are. <laughs> we're giving them names. We don't like when people call us by different names. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. We're giving them names. 
and we are having a lot of uh, uh, bias against different groups of thoughts. <laughs> oh, you are a good one, you are a bad one, and you are the ugly one. <coughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> So we have very strong uh, sense of uh, we polarize the situation. Uh, we're causing schisms between the thoughts. Try to create a conflict. So when you think about what we are doing with these thoughts. It's amazing, you know, how active we are in hijacking these thoughts. You know, when they're just passing by, <laughs> they're not doing anything. You know, they're not doing anything, they're just passing by. And we just grab them and then change them and try to change their out outlook. We change their attire. We put hats, we put boots, you know, then we, at the end when thoughts finally get to go, they look totally different <laughs> than how they first came or who they really are, you know. They don't come with all these hats and boots and different attire, you know, they just come very genuinely nakedly. There's nothing there. And we're putting all these, imposing all these things. It's like, you know, sometimes when our friends, parents try to make us wear something that we don't really like, you know, brocade things and so on. <laughs> <clears throat> you can Imagine how thoughts are feeling when we try to do that. <laughs> the same thing that they do to us, we are trying to do that to our thoughts. And so therefore the Mahamudra teaching is saying, just go back to its original state. You know, don't complicate, don't sophisticate, just rest in its simplicity. Simply rest in the naked nature of these thoughts. Simply see them as they are, as who they are, how they arise, not as how we want to see them with our dualistic thoughts. Just simply let the thought be thought, experience nakedly, simply, and rest within that. You know, that's what Mahamudra is saying here. The teachings are saying, instruction is giving that we should do this, uh, looking nakedly, look nakedly, rest directly. <clears throat> so, the basic Mahamudra approach here is very simple, right? Simple. Look at our simple nature of mind. Don't sophisticate it. Don't complicate. Don't make it so uh, complex. Be simple. Rest simply looks at the simple essence. Uh, things do not have to be so complicated, so sophisticated. That's what Mahamudra and Dzogchen are teaching, uh, teaching us. But as you know, we don't like to simplify things, right? We want to complicate things, isn't it? That's our samsari culture, right? If somebody tells you, 
You are so simple. <coughs> we get offended. <laughs> right? Why? We don't want to be simple. Then what is the compliment? When someone says, you are sophisticated. That's a great compliment. We love that. And we want to be sophisticated. Isn't it? That's totally opposite to what Mahamudra and Dzogchen are teaching here. You know, the instruction here is saying, don't sophisticate things. Be simple. Look at its simple essence. Raw and naked essence of thoughts. Just as they present themselves. And so, therefore, there's a second method here is resting simply in the essence of uh, the nature of our thoughts without further complicating it, without further sophisticating it. Just rest in the simple essence with a simple method. Then the third <coughs> Um, point here, Shaktabdi Nelikipa. Is being skilled in the essential points of resting. Tambo Mandi, Tamba Yaga, and Gordi Tamba. Tell them Mandonga. Teaching Yaga Yamba Tami. So before we um, get into a discussion about this point, we should sing the song <laughs> by Tamba Yaga. So we'll sing the verse about the ocean first, and then the verse about the water second. These are the two verses that you wrote down yesterday. So the, when you look at the clear bright ocean, it's the first verse, and then when the springtime sun starts to warm the earth, it's the second verse, even though we got them in the reverse order. <coughs> So, so I'll just um, read the verse and then we'll sing the song. Okay. So I'll just say them again so people can write them down. Anew. The first verse is, when you look at the clear bright ocean, When you look at the clear, bright ocean, and the waves rise up and dissolve back down, and the waves rise up and dissolve back down, don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? That thoughts are dharmakaya. That thoughts are dharmakaya. Then the second verse. When the springtime sun starts to warm the earth. When the springtime sun starts to warm the earth. And the ice melts into water. And the ice melts into water. Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? Samsara is nirvana. Nirvana. Samsara is nirvana. Nirvana. When you look at the clear bright ocean and the waves rise up and dissolve back down, don't you know this is a Lama teaching you?
Il regarde dans le bar, le monde. When he looked at the clear bright ocean And the waves rise up and dissolve back down Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you that all see that these first two techniques are emphasizing two most important uh, quality of meditation. The first method emphasizes one-pointedness, non-distraction, and the second method emphasizes uh, letting go, relaxation, relaxing at ease, relaxing at ease <clears throat> becomes a very important quality of a Mahamudra meditation as it is taught in the meditation of Mahamudra teachings <clears throat> that those who can relax the most can have the best meditation. Those who can relax middle can have the middling level of meditation. And those who can relax least forget it. <laughs> No, just kidding. <laughs> you know, that's what it doesn't say. Uh, instruction said, those who can relax the least can have a least meditation. You know, these three. And so therefore, um, from the Mahamudra point of view, meditation, a basic quality of meditation is relaxation, is resting. You know, resting at ease, relaxing at ease, letting go and relax. That's very important. When you can relax at ease, anything is possible. Everything is possible. Not only in the meditation, but also in the post-meditation. Isn't it? You know, when you can relax, then you can do a lot. You're capable. You're, you can be courageous, capable. Anything you can handle positively. But when you cannot relax, then nothing is possible. You know, even the most simple movement of yoga, for example, becomes very hard when you're not relaxed when your body is not relaxed. When your body is relaxed, then yeah. very hard yoga movement can become quite easy. And so therefore, these two techniques are showing us the two most important qualities of meditation. First being the non-distraction, one-pointedness, and the second being the uh, re relaxing at ease. You know, that's very important. It's important for us to have these two qualities together. It's important for us to have these two qualities not separate, 
<laughs> yes. Okay, check you the check man if we have one quality but not the other, then that will be of some slight benefit, but it won't produce a deep or great experience of meditation. To have a complete Mahamudra experience, we must have these two together. Then it shall talk to me like a person. Tell her, the name shall talk to she. Tamsi Guba Kawa Tabu. Sopun Tabba Cheba Tabu. Pujungi Lahan Tonga Tabu. Lambo Chela Chama Tabba Tabu. The third point is being skilled in the essential points of resting. And these are illustrated by four examples. Or this point is illustrated by four examples of how to rest. Resting like a Brahman spinning thread, resting like cutting the rope of a bundle of hay, <coughs> mm-hmm. resting like a child looking at a temple, and resting like striking an elephant with thorns. <laughs> nice. It's very, it's very Buddhist. <laughs> Um Tamsi Kuba Kawa Tabu Jaba de Jumlu Rambar Jaba. The example of a Brahman spinning thread is an example that teaches that we need a balance of <coughs> tightness and looseness in our meditation. The first example is, it is said that the Brahmins, when they spin, when they spin their thread, they are very skilled and very precise. When they do it, they do it in a perfect Mm -hmm. You know, with a perfect balance of tightness and looseness. You know, when you're not skilled and when you don't do it properly, if you spin it too tight, then it's a uh, It knots up. And too loose, It doesn't even become strong enough to be thread. Right, it breaks. So you need the perfect balance. Like, likewise, we need to find a perfect balance of being tightly, one-pointedly, focused, non-distracted, yet relaxed, at ease. You know, these two, we must find a perfect balance. If our meditation, concentration, is too tight, focusing on our meditation meditation, uh, technique is, if it's too intense, or tight, or stiff, it creates more distraction, creates more thoughts, creates more <clears throat> uh, physical and mental disturbances. So it becomes difficult to rest in meditation. On the other hand, if our meditation concentration is too loose, on the other extreme of being too relaxed, if we in that situation, then there will be another uh, obstacle to meditation, which is uh, mm-hmm. laziness. Yes laziness and also becomes dull, not sharp. Mind becomes dull and experience becomes dull. <clears throat> and so therefore we must find a perfect balance here. <clears throat> 
So how do we find a perfect balance? What is a perfect balance? There is no one thing as a perfect balance for everyone. You know, perfect balance is something we have to find individually. You know, uh, individually. For that reason, these two earlier techniques become so valuable to find this perfect balance for individual practitioners. When you concentrate, focus tightly, uh, one-pointedly with the uh, method of cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts first and when that becomes too intense, <clears throat> too intimidating, then using the second method, relaxing, uncontrived with whatever occurs. When you do these two together as a practitioner, then you will find the perfect balance between uh, tight and loose. Gomke. Mm. So, through practicing in this way, we find a good balance in our mind between tightness and looseness with respect to working with an object of focus. Um, it is also taught, you know, after you train in these two techniques for a while, <coughs> then you can alternate these two in your session of meditation. You, know, you can first focus on the one-pointed concentration and then when it becomes too focused, right, too much, too tight, then you relax. You relax at ease with the second technique and when you're relaxing at ease and with the second technique, if it's becoming too loose, if it's becoming too vague, <clears throat> if meditation is becoming too... Ah, then go back to the first one. So, alternate these two. Renjo Alternate these two. <laughs> <laughs> Good translation. Then there's a So if we practice in this way by alternating these two techniques, we'll come to a state where we'll find more of a natural balance between tightness and looseness. Where we will have to um, create this balance in the beginning, but it will just be there. That's why it said when we focus our minds in an intense way, if that becomes too much focus, our mind will naturally tend towards relaxation. Just like when you're spinning threads, if you uh, wind the thread too tight, then it naturally uh, wants to go the other way. Like as soon as you let go of the thread, it um, unravels. So it naturally tends toward the relaxation. <coughs> Yeah, So that was the first example of resting. Resting like a Brahmin spinning thread. And the second example is like cutting the rope of a bundle of hay. 
So where the Brahman spinning thread example um, taught the balance between tightness and looseness, this example of cutting the rope of a bundle of hay teaches that we need to be free from effort in our meditation. When you uh, bundle up a bunch of blades of grass together and that they turn into hay, and later on when you cut that, the rope that's keeping them all together, the blades of grass don't discuss with each other how they're going to work this falling situation out. <laughs> they don't say, I'm going to fall that way, so you fall this way. <laughs> You shouldn't fall for a while, but wait for a few seconds and then fall. But they just all fall completely naturally without any planning or, or theorization. And they don't have to put any effort. It takes place naturally. <clears throat> you know, naturally they fall, naturally they rest. You know, without much effort. Likewise, it is saying we must rest continually in the nature of a resting mind, looking at nature of thought or emotion, what have you, resting in that nature without much effort is uh, what is instructed here. So this instruction is referring and uh, mainly relating with the concept, idea of wanting to put effort in resting more. I want to rest more. How? This way, that way. A lot of planning and a lot of effort in resting. So this is instruct, instructing that do not put too much effort. Slight effort is necessary after that simply rest without effort. Because when you put too much effort there's a lot of concepts arising that oh I'm not resting I have a thought. Oh I'm not resting I have a distraction. I need the antidote to overcome this distraction. I need the antidote to destroy this thought and then come back to resting. There's so much effort, struggle going on in meditator's mind. So Mahamudra instruction here is saying, do not struggle. Do not overly exert. Do not uh, overly emphasize what is to be abandoned and antidote that transcends, that abandons these things. You know, these are taught even in the Hinayana, Mahayana, Shamatha. Right? There is a... Um, when we talk about the Shamatha's faults and antidotes, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the mistakes is overly applying the antidote. But here it is taught a slightly different way. The difference here is that Mahamudra teaching is saying that if you really think, if you really look at the nature here, then when there is an antidote, what is to be? Uh, Relinquish. What is to be relinquished, abandoned, has already ceased. Like when there is a thought, there is no antidote. Right? We, we see a thought and then we go and fetch our antidote. <laughs> and when we come back with our antidote, the thought is gone. Right? So when you shoot these arrows of antidote, there is no target. 
it's a kind of a waste of your time if you keep doing that too much. If you can recognize right at the moment of when thoughts are arising, it's useful. If you can look at its essence, it's useful. If you can rest within that, it's useful. If you can apply some antidote when that's happening, it's useful. But if you're bringing antidote after, after the thought has already ceased, it's not very useful. And it's just a struggle, a lot of struggle we go through. This one's a nyambo you do pangcha me, pangcha you do nyambo me. So when we have an antidote, we don't have the thing we want to be free from. When we have the thing we want to be free from, we don't have the antidote. Oh, this one's a thing that I can say in this one. So this is what it's referred to as um, futile mindfulness. It's using mindfulness in a way in which it can't produce a result because it's an antidote chasing after a thing to be relinquished that it will never catch. Present will never catch past. And so therefore, when you look at the situation, then our antidote, mindfulness, whatever antidote we apply, they're actually chasing after something that has already gone. Not very useful from Mahamudra point of view. So therefore, this uh, analogy we're using here is saying, just rest where you are. Relax at ease, like a bundle of string. What is it? Hey. Hey. You know, when, when the string is broken, you know, they just relax, they just fall and stay where they are. You know, they don't try to run, they don't try to uh, stand up still, you know, they just relax. Likewise, rest where you are within whatever thoughts occur. In brief, we Thank you. rest without activity or effort. Then, somebody the third example is that of a child looking at a temple. And this example teaches us how to rest without fixation. When practicing Mahamudra meditation, looking at the essence of mind, resting directly within that, and relaxing at ease, when you do such genuine Mahamudra meditation, there will be a lot of uh, meditative experiences arise. Experiences such as bliss, Blissful. Experiences where our body and mind will be filled with bliss, or our body and mind will be pervaded by Dewa. a sense of pleasant feeling or comfort, well being. The second type of experience is that of clarity or luminosity. So we see the nature of phenomena and the phenomena themselves very clearly in, in the midst of these experiences. 
And it's almost like we could have higher cognitive powers when we're in these states. The third type of experience is that of non-thought or non-conceptuality. And when we have these experiences, it seems like we have realized emptiness. <clears throat> However, these all are just temporary experiences. The word in Tibetan is nyam, which also carries a sense of um, falling away, fading away. So they're experiences, but they're only <clears throat> temporary. They only last. Um, for a brief period and then are replaced by another situation. And that's why the Lord of Yogis Milarepa said that experiences uh, experiences are like morning mist. They quickly disappear. And there are many stories in the history of Dharma where practitioners have been deceived um, by having clinging towards their experiences. They think that these experiences they're having, which are actually temporary, are the ultimate experience. Gambo and the Mare excellent experiences. And he offered his, um, he shared these experiences with his guru Milarepa, and Milarepa said, "That's nothing. Nothing. It's just a, it's just a temporary experience." But he said, "Just go back and meditate." But Gampo <coughs> thought to himself when he was having these that he had attained the first bodhisattva bhumi. So therefore, <clears throat> these experiences <clears throat> arise uh, for a genuine Mahamudra meditator. And so the question is, how do we deal with these experiences? And the instruction is, <laughs> Rest like a child looking at a temple. Free from fixation. Mm-hmm. And so they see everything very clearly, but they don't fixate on anything. They look at images of Buddhas, and they don't get overly happy or pleased by them. And they look at images of demons, and they don't get frightened by them. But the old people then, who are taking the children to these temples, say, oh, this is an old person. This is good, um, these people. And uh, these are demons, and they're bad. Tender will never. Then it 
Nyam Sambo, Nyam Nyamba, Kang Shana Yang, Talan Zabana Bapusung Kalana Tawan Bapusos. The Nyam Nata Shan. So, this example is teaching us how to work with these meditative experiences. Whether we have a good meditative experience or a bad meditative experience, don't fixate on it. Just um, rest without fixation, like a child looking at a temple. Yeah, simply relax and ease. You know, when these experiences arise, of course, as an ordinary practitioner, we get a little attached. You know, at the beginning, that's all right. But as soon as we realize we're getting attached, then we should look at these experiences like child looking at the uh, wall paintings of a temple where the child has neither good nor bad uh, feelings, concepts about these images. <laughs> Likewise, we should let uh, our mind experience these meditative experiences, yet at the same time be free from attachment, clinging. When you can let go of clinging and attachment to these experiences, then they become, you know, a very powerful experience that can lead us to realization, the true realization of the nature of the mind. But then when we actually do reach the level of realization, that is a changeless state. And Milarepa described it by saying, realization is like space, it is changeless. So, since the realization is changeless, we will also won't have fixation towards it when it happens. Shamba Manche the Nyamka comes at your order now. But the attachment comes in at the level of meditative experience. Most of the top of the year comes to Shamba Chuan, Shamba Minuan. But when we directly realize the true nature of mind and reality, then we don't have fixation towards that realization. Then they mela the bege round log bhujon ta bhur shose the da chhe bhar. And Milarepa also um, sings in his songs of realization, rest naturally like a small child, and so that's very much of the same meaning as we're looking at here. Shame bhujon ke shame ta mikhe so ta wadang na re da chhe ba. Then kaso the nyamyo na maja na chhe dang shi na. Make your soul tone. Now we dot dot your balance over. Shipping yam yum can't and can't get a yam. Tell a shame about and zamba maba. Shaji shaba. And we can also take this in a broader context, apart from just meditative experiences, um, to relate to sensory perceptions. Whatever forms we see with our eyes, whatever sounds we hear with our ears, and so forth, we don't. Um, block these sense perceptions. We let them happen clearly, but we don't fixate upon them either. We just rest, letting them be as they are. In a relaxed way. Naturally. <clears throat> the fourth example is that of striking an elephant with thorns. <laughs> and this example teaches us how to rest without adopting or rejecting, or without justification or rejection. It teaches us how to rest without Justifying or denying. When we rest, finally, when we have an experience, you know, good experience of resting, 
and within that resting, when thoughts move, when emotions move, when uh, other consciousness take place, movement, then resting, while resting, experience these movements without accepting or rejecting, without making any justification, without denying these movements. So this movement does not shake our resting mind, and our resting mind does not block these movements. When these two come together, resting mind and moving mind, when they can be friends to each other, when they can be present together, when they do not have to exclude each other, when resting doesn't have to exclude movement of thoughts, when movement of thoughts does not have to exclude resting, then Gautam uh, Then we have transcended um, justifying thoughts and blocking thoughts. then we don't have to uh, employ antidotes with effort. It comes naturally. We don't have to reject our thoughts, stop movement of thinking mind. It naturally dissolves merges with a resting mind. So at that point then they unite together. Then we can really say we have a good Mahamudra meditation when this takes place. In some sense we can say then this is the beginning of a good Mahamudra meditation. On the other hand, we can say this is the result of earlier hard work, of cutting through abruptly, uh, cutting abruptly through the suddenly arisen thoughts, and working with the resting uncontrived with whatever occurs. You know, all of those lead us to this fruition, so to speak. <coughs> And so, therefore, this becomes a very uh, important quality of a Mahamudra, actual Mahamudra meditation. The Langchen Sharma Tavandas. And this is taught to be like striking an elephant with thorns, and this is a very good example. Seven thorns. It's clear, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is clear. When the lambo chela, sarma chung chung chela, khazus sarma ta ke ta ke den lu khazus song na yang lambo chela yo ha shen do mai. Chuo ge de na yo ha shen men do na. Mo ge de kona se se. When you strike an elephant with thorns, the elephant will feel the thorns but won't be bothered by it. They'll just remain very stably in their posture without moving. Make them be, she was a very long language. Yabutor, Nanjing made Yabutor. They'll continue along with also their very peaceful gaze, elephants. Um, exemplify yes, meditative gaze very nicely. Yeah. <laughs> and so they won't be bothered by the thorns. They'll they'll feel them and they'll know they're there, but it won't change um, their 
stability. But if you strike other animals with thorns, then they'll just leap up in the air. Scream. Yes. Yell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>